Okay, guys, this is the uh, last lecture of the uh, of the semester, uh, which is exciting, I suppose. So uh, we're going to talk about rotational momentum. So first, I need you to look at the YouTube video uh, that I have uh, in here for this. Uh, it's the one with the guy holding onto the wheel. Uh, it looks like the wheel at the bottom there, and uh, it looks he he he's standing up, but he's going to do something similar to the girl in the chair. Um, so watch that first and then come back. Okay, you're back. So uh, try to twist the wheel in any direction without spinning it. So if you had one of these in your hand and it wasn't spinning, you would notice that you could twist it around uh, without any problem. You could uh, move it around with one hand very easily. So then get it spinning uh, and then try to do it again and it becomes a lot harder to get it to, to rotate. And then finally get it spinning really fast and get it uh, try to get it to rotate, and it's going to be even uh, more difficult. Um, I really can't demonstrate this with you, and I can't think of a good thing to demonstrate this with, so you're just going to have to trust me to some extent. If you watch that video, it's clear he's having a little bit of trouble getting it to turn. And the reason that is, uh, just like you have to apply a force over a period of time to change an object's linear momentum, you have to apply a torque over a period of time to change an object's angular momentum. And the angular momentum is based upon how quickly it is spinning, or one of the things it's based on is how quickly it's spinning. So the faster you spin it, the more torque you have to have, I'm sorry, I put a P where I should have put a T. You have to apply more torque in order to get it to spin, uh, or in order to change its direction because it's spinning. Um, so that's why that was a, a factor. So uh, the important factor is that the object is spinning, and the faster it spins, the more angular momentum it has, and the more difficult it is to change it, because angular momentum is equal to I omega, where I, remember, is that moment of inertia, which is the uh, equivalent of mass in linear motion, and omega is the angular speed, which is how fast it's spinning. All right. Now, with the wheel really spinning, step on the rotating surface and turn it over. Uh, this is what the guy did. So he was standing still, and when he rotated the wheel, he began spinning in the other direction. And that's because angular momentum, just like linear momentum, has to be conserved. So angular momentum before has to equal angular momentum after. And basically, the angular momentum of the system before was zero, and so the angular momentum of the system after uh, has to, sorry, the angular momentum of the system was zero, but the thing was spinning. So when he flipped it, he added angular momentum to the system, changed the angular momentum of the system by turning the wheel. So to compensate, the guy had to spin the other direction to keep the angular momentum the same. Uh, so the angular momentum was, a, it was you know rotating in whichever direction the wheel was spinning. And then when he flipped it, the angular momentum now for the wheel has changed signs, it's become negative. So to compensate, it has to spin him in the other direction to make uh, that angular momentum stay the same. Uh, and whenever he flipped it back and forth, you could see that he was changing the angular momentum of the, uh, of the, of the wheel, but the angular momentum of the system had to remain constant. So when he twisted it one way, he would spin. When he twisted the other way, he would stop. Uh, and that was because the angular momentum of the system was staying constant, uh, conservation of angular momentum. All right, so what is angular momentum? Angular momentum, if, uh, if an object moves from point A to point B, it has linear momentum, uh, P equals MV. If the object rotates about a center of mass or an axis, it has angular momentum. So the wheel that we saw was orbit or rotating about that center right there. So that was the angular momentum that we were talking about, and that's the reason it has angular momentum, because it's rotating. Just like linear momentum can be transferred from one object to another, Linear mom uh, so linear momentum can transfer, uh, sorry, linear momentum can transfer momentum from one object to another. If you have trouble remembering this, just remember the billiard ball example, the pool ball example, that'll help you out. Uh, angular momentum can also be transferred from one object to another. Uh, what you saw in the demonstration was that uh, momentum being transferred from the wheel to the person and from the person to the wheel. Uh, you can also look at it as that the Earth-Moon system is transferring angular momentum. Uh, very slowly, the moon is moving away from the Earth, and that is slowing the Earth's rotation rate down. 
Uh, you may have heard at some point that the dinosaur, when the dinosaurs were around, the or the the day was like 23 hours. Now it's 24 hours, and that's because the moon has gotten farther away, uh, and the angular momentum of the system has to be constant. So like the momentum of the moon is growing, so the momentum of the Earth has to slow down because we're a part of a system. Um, importantly, angular momentum and linear momentum are separate. They do not interact with one another. You can have angular momentum without having linear momentum. You can have linear momentum without having angular momentum. You can have both at the same time, uh, but it doesn't really matter. They're kept independent of each other. Uh, both will always be conserved in the absence of an impulse. So if there's no impulse, if there's no outside force, then the momentum before is equal to the momentum after. And if there's no outside torque, then the angular momentum before is equal to the angular momentum after. Okay, so whenever you're trying to determine whether or not it's uh, whether or not there's angular momentum is conserved, just think about whether or not there's a torque being applied. And remember, a torque has to have both a force and a radius. It has to be applied at a distance. So in order to apply torque to the wheel, you would have to put a force on the edge of the wheel. All right. I suppose you could put one in the middle, but then you'd break your finger. So you, like if you put your hand on the edge of the wheel to slow it down, you're applying a torque. It changes the angular momentum. Um, the angular momentum must have an origin point. So you have to have a point of origin or an axis. That's why this spot right here is the axis of that wheel. That would be the origin point. The Earth has a different angular momentum, for example, if you measure it about its axis through the center of the planet or if you measure it with the sun at the center. So if you imagine this is the, this is the Earth, uh, and I apologize, I did not get my protractor out to get a perfect 23.5 degree angle there. But if you measure the Earth about its axis, it's different than measuring it with the radius of the sun. You're going to have different radiuses uh, depending on which one you do. And that's fine. You can have different places where you measure from. Um, but you need to pick a spot to measure from in each problem and uh, identify that. So for example, with the one we were doing earlier with the wheel, I would pick the center of the wheel for the, the, the origin point for the rotation. All right. Um, if you're doing the earth, they're probably going to tell you, use the center of the earth, use the point uh, of the center of the sun um, to do this. They're, they'll tell you which point to use and just be aware that that's something that they will do. Okay. Um, so just to look at the formula here, uh, the angular momentum uh, is uh, equal to I omega, just like linear momentum was equal to mv, and the change in angular momentum is equal to torque times time. Now what does that mean? You can, it means you have three basic equations that you need to be aware of. One, angular momentum equals I omega. Two, change in angular momentum is equal to torque times delta t, and then putting those two together. I omega is equal to torque times delta t. Now you probably only need to use one per problem, but knowing that they exist like this, you can it'll probably help you out. So knowing that basically if you want, I should say delta omega, uh, knowing that if you want to change the speed, the angular speed, you gotta apply a torque. That's what this would be good for if you're trying to relate speed and torque. This one will be good for if you're just trying to find the change in momentum or if you have a change in momentum, what torque would be needed. And then this one's good for just figuring out what the angular momentum is. Um, let's see. Uh, there's also something called the angular momentum of an object that is not necessarily, doesn't look like it's moving at an angle. So uh, that's this right here, MVR sine theta. Um, it's a little bit more complicated uh, but like, imagine, if you will, that we've got a ball in blue that's going to hit this rod right here. Now, if that's the case, then it's going to hit it at a 90 degree angle, a distance r away. So if I wanted to know what the angular momentum of this is, okay, also, sorry, real quick, before we do that, notice that if this happens, if this blue ball hits this rod, it's going to cause the rod to spin, which is going to give it angular momentum. And so that's the reason you have to assume that this thing has angular momentum if it's capable of providing angular momentum to something. So for the, the ball here, the way I would do this is I would put the mass of the ball times the velocity the ball has times the radius, that would be this distance right here, the distance to the center of this object, and then sine 90. And if it hits at a perfect right angle, sine 90 is 1, and so this just becomes mvr. 
Now, whenever you have to bring in the angle is if it hits something like this. If it hits, you know, that was a terrible straight line. But if it hits right here, uh, then you would have to use this angle, all right? If it hits right here, you're gonna have to use this angle, all right? And the, the reason for that is that you have to take the component of velocity uh, that is acting um, on the, sorry, acting at a right angle to the radius, okay? All right, uh, this is the classic example of a, of a, a ballet, not a ballet, well, it could be a ballet, but this is a skater. So uh, the skaters, uh, the way they spin uses angular momentum. So you may have, if you've ever watched uh, uh, ice skating um, and you've seen them do a spin, you know that when they go into a spin, they tuck, uh, and that basically lowers their angular, or sorry, their moment of inertia and causes them to spin faster. And then when they put their arms out, it raises their moment of inertia and causes them to slow down. So remember the moment of inertia is equal to mr squared. So if you can make your mass have a larger radius, you're going to increase your i, all right? And then if we look at uh, angular momentum equals i omega, that Angular momentum has to stay constant because there's no outside force acting on this uh, ice skater. So if she raises her eye, she's going to have to lower... Wow, that was a really terrible omega. If she raises her eye, she's got to lower her omega and vice versa. If she tucks in, if she brings her arms in, she's going to lower her eye. So in this case, she's going to tuck her arms in, which means this radius is going down, which means this moment of inertia is going down. Angular momentum has to stay constant, so what that means is whenever you bring down i, you've got to increase omega. And so that will in turn cause her to spin faster. So when she puts her arms out, that increases her moment of inertia and slows her down. When she brings her arms in, it decreases her moment of inertia and brings her speed up. Okay, so let's look at just a few problems. None of these are math, these are, are like hard math, these are just basically, uh, uh, conceptual types. Uh, if you double an object's rotational speed, what happens to the angular momentum? Well, it's a direct relationship. Uh, L is equal to I omega. Before you ask, I really don't know why it's L. It just is. Uh, so if you double an object's rotational speed, if we double this, then we would have to double this. All right, so it would double. Uh, a small dense object is spun around a string at 10 meters per second. If you triple the length of the spring, without changing, sorry, if you triple the length of the string without changing the speed, what happens to the object's uh, angular momentum? Well, V is equal to omega r, uh, something we've talked about before. So V, the velocity, is equal to omega r. And so if you keep V the same and you uh, triple the length of the, the string, you're going to divide that radius by three, and so basically, omega would decrease. It'd be, it would now be 3.33. It would decrease by a factor of three, uh, because it's a it's a basically one to one relationship, or sorry, inverse relationship. Uh, in other words, v over r is equal to omega. So if you keep v constant and change r, then omega has to change, and it changes by the inverse. Uh, of whatever your r is. If you decrease r, omega is going to increase. If you increase r, uh, omega is going to decrease. All right. A Ferris wheel takes a long time to get up to speed. If you double its radius without changing its mass or its engine, will it take more or less time to get up to speed? Okay, so we got to get time involved here. Since we have time involved, we're going to be doing i omega equals torque times delta t. And I know that I have to use that because I'm looking at angular speed, looking at speed, and I'm looking at time. And so that's a key that I've got to use both of those uh, at the same time. So let's look at it. Remember, we're, we're, it, we're changing, not changing its mass, but we're doubling its radius. So what is that going to do to the moment of inertia? We're going to raise the radius. That's going to raise I. Okay? So I'm going to raise I. We want to keep omega the same. We're trying to get it up to the same speed. Okay? Uh, and I'm assuming since we're, we're not changing the engine, that torque is going to be the same. So the engine can only apply a certain torque to the Ferris wheel. So if I'm increasing I, 
I'm keeping Omega the same and I'm keeping Torque the same, I'm gonna have to increase the time it takes to get the Ferris wheel spinning, okay? Um, which is easier to balance, a carrot with its thick end up or a carrot with its thick end down? If it has its thick end up, it's easier to balance because it's got a bigger eye, which makes it more difficult to rotate. All right, which will have the greater acceleration when rolling down an incline, a bowling ball, or a volleyball? Defend your answer. Uh, the, uh, the bowling ball will have a greater one because its eye is... Uh, it's got a, it's going to have a smaller eye relative to the object. A solid sphere rolls better down a hill than a hollow sphere. Um, that's from the rotational kinetic energy unit. Uh, the most popular gyroscope in, or sorry, the most popular gyroscope around is the frisbee. What function, besides being a place for gripping and catching, does the thicker curved rim serve? Basically, that thicker curved rim makes the eye bigger. You've got more mass at the edge, which increases that eye. If you increase the eye, it makes it more difficult to stop spinning, which is why the Frisbee continues to spin. Why and how do you throw a football so that it spins about its axis when traveling through the air? You put a spin on it initially. Uh, you put an initial spin on it. Uh, since there's very little torque acting on the ball when it's in the air, other than air resistance, uh, it continues to spin through the air. Okay, if a trapeze artist rotates twice each second while traveling through the air and contracts to reduce her rotational inertia to one-third, how many rotations will result? Okay, so we've got, whoops, uh, we've got I omega, that's what we're dealing with, is equal to angular momentum, okay? And so basically... Uh, we are keeping the angular momentum the same. So I want the same number here. And so uh, initially, she is, and this is one of those where you can just make up something for I. There's no, there's no real, we're just reducing it to the third. And so I'm going to just say I is one. Rotational, uh, uh, sorry, the speed would be two uh, rotations per second. And that's going to be equal to L. So L's got to equal two. One times two is uh, two. So I've got to keep L equal to two. And so now I'm going to do one third I. So one third of that. So what do I have to have the speed be in order to still equal two? It's got to be six uh, in order for L to still equal two because the rotational and rotational momentum has to remain constant because there was no outside torque. And so she would be going six rotations per second now. All right, you sit in the middle of a large, freely rotating turntable at an amusement park. If you crawl toward the outer rim, does the rotational speed increase, decrease, or remain unchanged? What law of physics supports your answer? Okay, you sit in the middle of a freely rotating turntable at an amusement park. If you crawl to the outer rim, does the speed increase, decrease, or remain the same? So again, remember, angular momentum before has got to equal angular momentum after. But if you crawl to the edge, remember I is equal to mR squared. If you crawl to the edge, you're increasing R and you're increasing I. So we've got I omega has got to be equal to, so I omega before has got to be equal to I omega after. And since I'm increasing my I, my angular momentum has to go down in order to compensate. And so it will go, it'll slow down. And the law that supports this is the conservation of angular momentum. All right. Whew. All right. You are done with notes for the year. So that's uh, that's nice, right? So uh, yeah, go deer. <laughs>